Good afternoon, and welcome to the Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum. 75 years ago, in the shadow of the Second World War, Jerry Rappaport, then an 18-year-old 1L at HLS, decided that aspiring lawyers needed, a, needed regular opportunities for engagement with vital issues that connect our study of law to a rapidly changing world. For Jerry, this, was, this engagement was an essential part of preparing Harvard lawyers for the leadership roles that so many of our graduates assume. And that sense of civic duty and of the responsibility of leadership inspired him to found the Harvard Law School Forum, a student organized speaker series that has long been dedicated to discourse on a range of subjects of high public importance. Nearly three quarters of a century later, through a generous gift of the Rappaport Foundation, we launched last March yet another vehicle for robust discussion and debate. The HLS Rappaport Forum is designed to promote full, open, vigorous discussion, a respectful clash of ideas about critical and complicated issues facing our community, our nation, and our world. In this way, the Rappaport Forum furthers the essential role of a great university as a place of productive and meaningful inquiry, a place where debate, disagreement, and differences of opinion deepen our knowledge and bring us closer to truth and understanding, and where we advance that crucial objective by listening generously to those with whom we disagree. I wanna thank Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport for their deep and longstanding support for Harvard Law School, for their commitment to meaningful public discourse, and for their generosity in making the HLS Rappaport Forum possible. They model wonderful civic engagement for all of us. Now on to today's forum. The topic is reform of the Supreme Court, a great and timely subject. The federal court system, of course, exercises critical authority in protecting our rights. It also does so without electoral accountability. So we always need to be thinking about the role of courts and particularly of the Supreme Court in our system of government. And that's what our distinguished panel and the more than 1300 people who are joining this webinar today are gonna do. And for those in the audience, please use the Q&A function if you have questions for the panel, they'll take them at the end. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn things over to our moderator, Annette Gordon-Reed, the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard University. will say more about today's topic and introduce our guest speakers. But before I do, I'd like to thank Linda Greenhouse, Larry Kramer and Sai Prakash for being with us today, and to thank Professor Gordon Reed for moderating what I know will be a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's good evening to everybody. It's wonderful to be here to talk about this very timely and hot topic, the Supreme Court. And we have wonderful people to conduct this discussion. And as John said, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of them by putting your questions in the Q&A function and I will relay them to the panelists. We wanna start with Linda Greenhouse, is a senior research scholar in law at Yale Law School. For many years, she was the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times where she won a Pulitzer Prize for journalism. Among her books are Becoming Justice Blackman and the US Supreme Court, a very short introduction. She currently writes the twice monthly op-ed column for the New York Times about the Supreme Court. Then we have Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer is the president of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation as the former Dean of Stanford Law School. He's a noted scholar of American constitutional law and is the author of many articles and numerous books, including The People Themselves, Popular Constitutionalism and Judicial Review and Judicial Supremacy and the End of Judicial Restraint. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan Jr. Finally, we have Sakrishna Prakash, who is the James Monroe Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. He too has authored many articles and numerous books, and his books include Imperial from the Beginning, The Constitution of the Original Executive, and most recently, The Living Presidency, an originalist argument against its ever-expanding powers. Professor Bakash clerked for the Supreme Court for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. So these people have many, many more accomplishments 
uh, that I don't list here, but I wanted to give you a flavor of why they're the perfect people to talk about this subject of reform of the Supreme Court with a question mark at the end. And I wanna begin there to ask all of you, do you agree with the premise? Do you think that the Supreme Court is in, at a crisis point uh, at this particular moment? And if it is there, how did it come to pass? How did we get to this place where we're thinking about the, the court in this way with numbers of people talking about reforming it and changing it and doing all kinds of things? First, are we at a crisis point with the Supreme Court? Linda, do you want to start us off? Unmute. <laughs> sorry. No um, Zoom moment would be, would be perfect without that. But go ahead. <laughs> right, sorry. Uh, so, you know, of course, it depends what we mean by crisis. Uh, can the court still decide cases? Uh, yes. I mean, it, 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 so to, to that extent, it's not a crisis. If, if you define crisis as a loss of public legitimacy, mm -hmm. so that people look at the nine justices and see, as uh, Justice Stephen Fryer has been warning for some years, just nine politicians and rogues who are projecting their personal preferences onto the pages of US reports. Um, I think we're, we're, we're pretty close to there. And, and uh, you know, one thing that, that happened, uh, I guess it happened when Justice John Paul Stevens retired in 2010, 11 years ago, wow. Uh, what we then had was a court where all the more liberal members of the court had been appointed by Democrats, all the more conservative members of the court had been appointed by Republicans. That uh, identity, of appointing president and ideology was really something new. Uh, you know, Earl Warren was appointed by Dwight Eisenhower, uh, as was Justice Brennan, and so on and so on. So there really had never been a case, at least not in, not in modern American history, where the public could look at these nine people and see them projecting the ideological preferences of the political party that brought them to the dance. And, and so that was inherently dangerous. And then the question is, how does the court navigate that dangerous territory? And I guess that's that's the premise that we're here to talk about. I just want to make one other 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 point uh, that goes to the title of our program, Reform of the Supreme Court question mark. So back in the days when I worked for the New York Times as a daily journalist, the word reform had a very interesting valence. And uh, it, it was regarded as a dangerous word in, for, for journalistic objectivity, mm -hmm. because it implied that the thing that was going to be reformed would be better than the thing that came before. Mm -hmm. So in the news columns of the Times, you couldn't, for instance, say campaign finance reform, because that would imply that something was going to be better than it came before. That was a judgment. So I, I, I just kind of put that out there uh, as, as we go forward and talk about this. Um, are we assuming that we're talking about making something better? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you mentioned something, you sort of alluded to a history, a sort of a change over time in the way people saw the court. What, what happened? This is the second part of my question. How do we come to the point where people could look at uh, the members of the court and see them projecting um, political views, although I guess, and I would add to that, hasn't that always been sort of a part of this? I mean, people picked justices, Jefferson picked Repub what he thought were stalwart Republican, Republican at that time, uh, justices who were gonna do the law in a Republican way and Federalists wanted Federalist people. But you're saying that something, this is different and what happened? What do you think happened? Well, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with kind of a small N because, you know, yeah. not that many people have ever served on the court, but it, it, there have been different reasons for putting people on the court. I mean, Eisenhower picked Earl Warren to get him out of Republican politics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, President Gerald Ford picked John Paul Stevens because um, he had a vacancy to fill and he actually wanted the best person available. And he asked his attorney general, Edward Levy, very distinguished. Attorney General, uh, you know, give me something, somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, Attorney General Levy came up with uh, Judge Stevens, from whom he knew well, from Chicago, from the 
Seventh Circuit that didn't have an ideological cast. John Paul Stevens actually had no ideology. Uh, so it's been different, you know, over, over time, different reasons. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan picked Sandra Day O'Connor uh, because he had promised on the campaign trail that he was going to name the first woman justice, and he had a very small number of people to choose from. There were hardly any women and hardly any Republican women on, on the federal courts mm -hmm. um, and, and so on. But what's happened in uh, certainly the years that we've seen now um, under the banner of, you know, no more suitors, no more David Souter who drifts to the left having been chosen by the first President Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, careful vetting, choosing people with records on the federal appeals courts, um, you know, kind of vetted ideologically recently are, are they you know served up are, are, are they do they have a stamp of approval from the federalist society for instance mm -hmm. so you know it's just become a much more politicized process than i think it it typically has has been over time side mm -hmm. oh it's great to be with you folks today and linda said so much that was right on point um are we in a crisis i i think there's a a, a level of disquiet in certain quarters. Um, I have my own concerns about the court, but I don't think it's a crisis. It's not like the COVID crisis or the policing crisis or other sorts of crises that occupy the public's attention. If we look at the Supreme Court's opinion rating, it's fairly high. It's much higher than Congress. Congress would be envious if it had the Supreme Court's rating. It's certainly lower than it was in the past, but I think it's close to 60%. Mm -hmm. And I think that's due to the fact that most people don't pay attention to what the court does. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, I, I agree that the court and our judicial system have, ha, ha, you know, have a series of problems. I just don't believe it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, there's no part of this where you're saying how we've come to this past. There's no past to come to. You think this is pretty much a continuation of business as usual. Well, I, I do think there are problems and the problems continue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I were to identify the problem, I would say it's the problem of judicial amendments to the Constitution with no mechanism to overturn them. Mm -hmm. No, no ready mechanism, because amending the Constitution by formal means is impossible. And if the judges are the only ones who can inform it, can, can amend it by informal means, then they hold the, the keys to the kingdom. So I agree there's a problem, but it's been there. It's been there for, you know, from the beginning, right? There's always been this issue about the court's being into too independent. And, you know, Brutus, one of the anti-federalists said the judges are independent of heaven itself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true. Mm -hmm. Larry? No, I, I think I'll answer this a little differently. So first, the question whether there's a crisis is a straight up political question. And, you know, the answer is, it depends on who you ask. For some people, there is a crisis and for others, there is not. And the question when there's, when there's a crisis full blown is when there's enough people who think there's a crisis that something actually happens. Mm -hmm. So I think there clearly are people who think there's a crisis and more than there were a few years ago because of what's happened in recent years. Um, but you know, as both Cy and Linda point out, I think in terms of broad public confidence, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is a separate question from whether there's a need for reform of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So I think there absolutely is a need for reform of the Supreme Court, and there has been for a really long time. So in some sense, the political question is whether there's enough people who think there's a crisis that we have an opportunity to actually get some reform. And there's no question that for the people who think there's a crisis, that's driven by their politics. The shift is on the left. But, you know, to me, that's, a, as I say, a totally separate question. The need for reform is there, and the question is whether there's an opportunity. And the need for reform is there. So here's where I think I would differ both from Linda and Sai. It has not been there from the beginning. And you're right, you know, presidents have always taken politics into account significantly when they made not every single president and not every single appointment, but often. But what changed was something that really started with Brown in the 1950s and really took off in the 1980s, which is the power, the perceived power of the Supreme Court in political culture, popular political culture, has vastly expanded, like vastly. So the stakes were, you know, there were stakes, but they were nowhere near as high as they have become recently. And to me, the inflection point was the Bork hearings. The reason that was so powerful was because it sort of got pushed out into the public as, oh my God, the person you put on the court next is going to decide your constitutional rights once and for all. And they're going to decide in that case whether Roe v. Wade survives or not, you know, and so on. 
And that embrace of judicial supremacy was the thing that was new. There had always been claims for it, but its broad acceptance within the popular political culture is something of, from relatively recent decades. And it raises the stakes in every appointment hugely, and it's created bad incentives. So now presidents are much more fastidious to make sure that they are picking people who will further their ideological agenda for reasons that I think actually are politically immoral to extend their power well past their term in office. That gives them incentives then to appoint people who are effectively children, you know, the younger, the better, so they can be there that much longer to push your agenda. There are no children longer. on the court. <laughs> Almost. It depends on where you're sitting from. You know, I hate to say it, but I've reached that age where, you know, like Amy Barrett is a child as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, you know, and, and so, so you, you know, you have those kinds of incentives, which then exacerbates the problem because now you are that much more likely to have a court with justices on it who are way out of sync with where the political system is because they were appointed 30 years ago by somebody else in a different time, but a whole different way of thinking about, about where the law is and where the world is and where, you know, it ought to be. And, and so where you get these crises and where we could have one is when you have a court that ideologically is way out of sync with where the political branches are. While there's real division, so the political branches remain divided, then you don't get a crisis. But with a very liberal president, if the Democrats really were, say, for instance, to extend their control of Congress, you'd have something like, you know, what happened in the 1930s with Roosevelt and the conservative court, and what happened in the 1850s, 60s with, you know, the very conservative justices and the Republicans taking over and, and, and so on. So, so that's the kind of dynamics as I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, Annette, can I, if I could just weigh oh, in? Oh, please do. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, Larry mentioned the, the pork battle in uh, 1987, uh, which, of course, is just a font of, of rich thoughts about our, our subject. So I'll just, I'll just make one other point about the pork battle, which what it exemplified and, and, I, and why the nomination failed is that uh, the Reagan administration, kind of in its, in its waning years, uh, Reagan having been in office for almost a full two terms by then, sought to use the power of Supreme Court appointment to advance an agenda that he could not achieve legislatively, even when uh, Republicans have controlled the Senate, which they had until the 86 uh, midterms, right on the eve of the court nomination. And so, uh, you know, yes, judicial supremacy, it was the, the president who sought to use, use the court to get what he couldn't otherwise get. And I think that's one thing that propelled us into the situation that we're now in. Mm -hmm. If I can, can I also, just one other quick point, just for context here, which is um, where you see the idea, you know, the Supreme Court decides now 75, 80 cases a year, but of those only five or six actually matter for this whole debate, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so people too often, you get people like, oh, the ideology doesn't show up. Look, there's lots of unanimous cases that are divided. You know, the key is, the cases that matter, the five or six each term, which are the reason we're having this debate, is where you see it, and it absolutely shows up totally there. So I think it's just worth keeping that in mind. Mm -hmm. Sai, you were going to say something? Yeah, I mean, I think Linda is right that presidents are, you know, trying to just get things through the courts that they can't get through Congress. But of course, that's just true for every litigant or many litigants before the courts, right? They, they cannot pass their agenda legislatively. And then they go to the courts. And so it's not that Reagan started this process. Litigants have been doing this for generations. And I, I guess I'd add to what Larry said. It's not just a question of sort of tremendous deference to the courts when it comes to deciding what our constitutional rights are. I think the plausible universe of constitutional claims has expanded over time. There's more differences of opinion as to what is in the Constitution and what is not. And where that's true, courts, because they, quote, have the final say, unquote, will have a greater say in what, what the actual, you know, on the ground rights will be. And of course, that makes it a, a different institution than it would have been 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, the president, if I may, the president is, other litigants do that, but is there something different about the president doing that? I mean, uh, as a, an example to the nation, and you're talking about uh, separation of powers and so forth. If the president is attempting to to get what you know that way, what he cannot get legislatively or through his the executive office. I mean, uh, th you're right. I mean, everybody tries to get what they can, but president is different. Well, I, yes and no, and that because I think most litigants and most presidents think that their theory of the Constitution is right. Yeah. And so they're then they think they're just advancing the quote right theory. 
The problem is that there are many right, there are many claims about what the right theory is, and there are many different possible results. Mm -hmm. And in an era where, you know, five justices can choose this right theory or that right theory, obviously they're essentially deciding the content of the constitution, right? We all have this copy, but this just doesn't sort of really tell us much about our modern constitutional law. It's the opinions of the justices mm -hmm. because of the judicial supremacy that Larry talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Larry, you mentioned Brown. Could you talk a little bit more about how Brown and why Brown, you see this as something of the genesis of, of where we are right now? Sure. So I'd say there's two things, and it's not Brown itself. Brown starts a process. Mm -hmm. Cooper B. Aarons is the first point at which the Supreme Court actually explicitly lays claim to being supreme in the interpretation of the Constitution. But, you know, the reason is historically the claim for judicial supremacy is there in the 1790s, as you know. It's always yeah. part of the debate, but it's never <laughs> dominant. And whenever the court actually pushes that way, it gets repudiated. And and that's largely because I'm going to use left right, but you know what counts as a conservative or a progressive changes over time. We think of the Jacksonians as conservative today; they were the progressives of their era, and so on. But across American history, conservatives always supported strong judicial authority, and progressives always opposed it. And essentially, what happens with Brown is the left flips. Suddenly, they discover, you know what, <laughs> this like judicial supremacy stuff can, because for the first and only time in American, and only time, I should say, in American history, you get an activist liberal court, and it's doing all these things that they like. So the left suddenly embraces judicial supremacy, and the right doesn't change. The right continues to hold that notion of the Supreme Court as final word on the Constitution, and the debate shifts. And since I think he's out there in the audience, I have to give credit to Mark Tushnet, who made this point for me. It's the first place I saw it, which is, and the debate shifts. Prior to Brown, the debate over the Constitution had always been about who has final interpretive authority. After Brown, there's a kind of consensus that it's the court and the debate shifts to the modern one we have now about how to interpret the Constitution because now the stakes and how to interpret have gone up hugely because it's gonna be this body that does it. And mm -hmm. you can see that really clearly. That's just another reflection. And even that doesn't take place in a day. I mean, all through the 60s, you know, Nixon is running an anti-court uh, campaign and impeach or warn. So it, that's why I think, you know, it's, as you know, in history, these things are happening sort of gradually and different, coming to be embraced by different populations and groups over time. The Bork hearings to me are significant only in that they really forced the issue into the broad popular political culture. So they're the culmination of something that sort of starts with Brown. Mm -hmm. Desai and, and Linda, have you thought about Brown in that way as the genesis of Yes, I, I, I think Larry's exactly right. And, and uh, you know, in, in, the, in the aftermath of, of Brown qua Brown uh, and the rise of Richard Nixon, uh, all, all kinds of consequences for the, for the whole legal system in that, for instance, uh, it, when it no longer became uh, politically palatable for Republicans to run against the Brown regime against desegregation, we had, you know, the, the war on crime as a, as, a, as a substitute. And that's what Nixon really ran on, you know, uh, against the, he couldn't explicitly run against Brown. So he ran against the war on court uh, criminal procedure uh, revolution and, and, and so on. But, you know, it, it, to pick up on what, on what Larry said about the flips between left and right with respect to the courts, one thing that's fascinating to me anyway, going on today, is the flip about uh, on, on the question of who gets access to courts. And we saw that a couple of weeks ago, there was a case that, you know, probably most people didn't have reason to pay attention to was about uh, standing, you know, who gets into court. And lo and behold, um, you know, con conservative judges who used to think that uh, there ought to be a high bar to standing, now love standing. They want everybody in because uh, they've got a mission for the courts. They want to get their cases and their claims before the judges. And so uh, it, it, it's the liberals that are becoming a little bit wary of the open door to the courts. And, uh, you know, it's good. It, I think it's, it's good. Maybe it's comforting, I don't know, to have some historical perspective on this because um, things change. Mm -hmm. Also, Annette, just two other quick points, because this will bring it back to our the title of this debate. So one is the flip on the left doesn't happen in a day. Particularly the older liberals who fought the, you know, the Lochner battle, they are not comfortable with this judicial supremacy claim. They like the outcome in Brown, but they're troubled. It's the younger 
liberal scholars, and then who, of course, are no longer younger by the 60s, 70s, <laughs> and 80s who make that flip. Mm -hmm. The other point to recognize is the form that the flip takes is the delegitimation of all of the traditional devices that were politically used to control the court. So the notion that it's like beyond judicial independence, an assault on judicial independence to add judges, to slash jurisdiction, to fix the budget, to modify the procedures. Of, those were the tools that had been used from Jefferson, Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, both Roosevelt. You know, those were considered appropriate, plausible, because they are clearly constitutional. And those are the ways in which the political branches would push back on the court when it sought to assert itself. And they get delegitimated by liberal scholars in that period after. And that's really how judicial supremacy cashes out. Now, you don't. the only way you have to control the court is the nearly impossible task of amending the Constitution or waiting for one of them to die or retire in the hopes that you get the chance to put somebody more to your liking on the appointments power. And we've delegitimated all the other control devices, mm -hmm. even though they are clearly constitutional and were used across American history. So Sai, you were mentioning at the beginning that you didn't. You rejected the notion of a crisis at the point of a crisis, but as Larry said, that there's a difference between that and the idea that there might be some reform needed. Do you think that the court should be reformed? Well, I, I completely agree with what Larry said. Um, I, I think that the judicial system as a whole could use some reform. It's not just the court. It's the idea that the court will decide what the Constitution means and what the you know, and and that the political branches have no ability to overturn that decision. And by a 5-4 vote, we, you know, one constitutional right is read out of the constitution and a new one is, is read in. So I certainly agree with Larry's point that whether or not there's a crisis, there's, there's a case for reform to be made. And I, I've long believed that this is a, an issue that our constitution has, that if you're going to, you know, basically make it very difficult to amend the constitution, but make the Supreme Court final practically speaking, with respect to most constitutional interpretations, then the court has is basically an ongoing constitutional convention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what would you do? What in the ways of reform? You know, there have been a lot of talk of reform about age limits and jurisdiction stripping and adding new justices. I actually don't think that they get at the problem as because the way I've defined the problem, at least as I see it, and other people will see different problems, is there needs to be a check on the court's decision making after the fact in the hands of Congress or in the hands of the states or in the hands of some politically responsible entity so that the justices just don't have the authority to remake the constitution with, with five votes. And you know, I think we've seen that over the years where the justices have essentially remade the constitution and there is no check on it. You know, there've been a number of amendments that have overturned the Supreme Court, but there haven't been any in modern time. And there've, there've been very few formal amendments. There's been far more judicial amendments to the constitution. So I see a problem that I don't know, I'm not sure if it resonates with the people today who see a crisis because they see the crisis as either a stolen seat or a, a conservative Supreme Court that may strike down rights that they favor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what would that look like? Well, and, you know- you're, can, you're the czar of this. Uh, what, what, how would the, the system change so that the Supreme Court is moved out of that role of super legislature or whatever. Um, you, you've, you put me on this, you've put me on the spot in it. I, I think something like some sort of majority override or super majority override of a, of a judicial decision of the Supreme Court is entirely appropriate. Mm -hmm. the, the judicial independence that we have from England was designed to protect you know, the courts from the executive, but our courts here are actually far more independent of the legislature as well. There was a there was a mechanism in the English system to have parliament petition the crown to remove them. Mm -hmm. There is no such you know, mechanism today. You've got to go through the impeachment process. Um, so I, I think there's, there's, some, there's some need for the political branches to have some check on the court and not have the court really as the ultimate and final expositor of the constitution. And that is, I think in keeping with Larry's sense of judicial supremacy, this is in some sense a, a undoing of that, at least a partial undoing of that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Larry? So, you know, my own, it's a little different. So first I would define the problem a little differently. To me, the problem is the problem of independence versus accountability. If you're gonna have a Republican government, you need a government that on the one hand is accountable. That's the very definition of Republicanism, accountable to the people, accountable to the community, but it also is independent enough to actually lead and govern. 
when it came to the political branches, you see how the people who crafted the Constitution came up with different ways to balance that independence and accountability, making the House more accountable, but still independent, frequent elections, small districts, the, you know, the Senate and so on. When it came to the courts, they, since no one was remotely imagining anything like modern judicial review or judicial supremacy, they were focused on, you know, their own experience of courts where, you know, they didn't want the the king, the president, to be able to come in and say, I don't care if he's innocent, I want him convicted. Mm -hmm. So they made the courts very, very independent, thinking about the decisions in individual cases. So that's what creates our problem. So the question is, how can you rebalance the independence and accountability? And the tools that were historically used are one way to do it, but I think it's hard to resurrect them or bring them back now. So for me, I look at constitutions in the rest of the world, particularly post-World War II constitutions, and they have come up with a more clever way to balance independence and accountability. So, which is essentially to have judges who are appointed for limited terms that are staggered. So you have, a, and require a supermajority in the legislature in order to get them appointed. So the supermajority requirement, filibuster makes sense in this context, um, ensures that you're gonna get some buy-in across party lines. And the staggered regular terms means the court is never gonna veer too far away from the rest of the political system. And the check then is built in because Although the court, even if even if you have the court final vis-a-vis -vis the other branches, it's not final vis-a-vis -vis itself. And one thing we've seen over time, the court actually overturns itself all the time. When I wrote this stuff on popular constitutionalism, I got this pushback about we need judicial supremacy in order to have settlement of issues. And the fact is the Supreme Court, you every they, they overturn and modify and change themselves all the time. So by keeping the membership relatively aligned with where the political system is through regular appointments, you can solve that problem. And that's the proposal of, you know, the Carrington Crampton proposal that we've talked about where you add a justice, one justice every term of Congress and the nine most junior ones sit and decide the cases. The others remain justices, perform all the other tasks that judges can perform, sit on lower court cases if they want and all of that. So it's consistent with article three, but it, it, it amounts to a de facto staggered 18 year term, right? Where you have that kind of regular turnover. So I would be very happy with that. It's equally fair to both parties in the sense that neither party gets a systematic advantage other than what they gain by actually winning elections on a regular basis. It takes away the incentives to appoint young people to the court because they're gonna be there forever because they won't. Um, you know, it really solves all of the problems I think as I define them, which as I say, are trying to keep the court from being just too out of whack with the rest of the society and where it is. So your your primary concern is the, that they are out of touch, yes. having it out of touch, uh, not, it's not, it isn't the politics. Well, you know, it's it. constitutional politics. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it does rest from some notion that, you know, I think um, we, we'll have reasonable disagreements about how to interpret the constitution, which is the whole idea behind popular constitutionalism. That's supposed to evolve and is going to no matter what, even originalism evolves because mm -hmm. people's understanding of original intent just seems to change over time. So, and that's that's not surprising. That's an epistemological, you know, thing. So so this way you're, you're retaining the key republicanism value, which mm -hmm. is the ultimate decision about the meaning of our constitution rests with the people who made the constitution and whose constitution it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Linda, what, what do you think of that proposal? <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've come around to thinking that term limits one way or another, whether this particular proposal of basically growing the court by adding a new, a new justice every two years or uh, through some other mechanism, I think it would have the, uh, it, it would have the effect of a couple of things, removing the randomness of one president gets three, another president gets none, uh, removing the extreme temptation to stage a strategic retirement for that very reason. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't, I don't think it would lower the temperature necessarily of, of each appointment, but it would, it would be clarifying if uh, people go to go into the polls to elect a president know, know that this president is going to make two Supreme Court appointments. Uh, you know, until, until this most recent election, we went through many election cycles with the Supreme Court never coming up in a debate. Uh, you know, there it was sitting there, but nobody would think to, to mention it. And, uh, you know, the other thing I would say, what, something that Larry said that's very useful, 
uh, because we are the oldest constitution in the world, um, everybody who's come after us has been able to take a look and see what's good and what's bad, what works and what works less well. And uh, we are the only country in the world that has life tenure for its high court. Uh, in fact, even among the states, uh, there's only one state, it's Rhode Island, that has life tenure for its state court judges. Everybody else has voted with their feet in some other kind of, kind of way of limiting uh, the, the tenure of judges. So I think that's, you know, that, that's a, a good idea. Um, you know, Cy mentioned uh, uh, overrides the ability to, uh, for the, the political branches to reject, reconsider, whatever you want to call it, um, a, a constitutional holding of the Supreme Court. And uh, other systems have that too. Um, uh, the Canadian Charter has what's called a notwithstanding clause which means that, and I'm, I, I don't know enough about the Canadian system to know whether that applies to charter interpretation or just to statutory interpretation, but uh, in other words, uh, the opinion doesn't go into effect until the legislative branch has a chance to reconsider it and, and push back. I mean, there are many ways that, that this can be organized and, um, you know, one, one other would be in, in the appointment process, the nomination process itself. Uh, you know, we've gotten rid of the filibuster um, uh, lately and uh, the three justices appointed by Donald Trump would not have been confirmed had the filibuster been in effect requiring 60 votes. Uh, they all got the, the bare minimum or the bare minimum plus one or two. And I think there is, uh, something to be said for building in a super majority for appointing it, it, it dry it means that a president could no longer uh, appoint someone as extreme as possible and still get uh, 50 votes plus the vice president uh, other Germany has this uh, has a super majority requirement uh, built in so there are a lot of you know once we define the problem there are a lot of solutions that are kind of uh, uh, out there in, in, in the water right now. And, and I think a great number of them uh, are, are, could, could be useful. How would that, would that change the way the justices saw themselves and the way people see the justices? Well, more openly, I mean, Larry or, or Cy, the more openly, is this even more, more political, openly political? Your proposal, Larry, is the idea to make people think about- so, Well, so I don't know what I think. I mean, I think it would certainly change the way the justices see themselves and the way we see them. Um, I think there are many, many things that contribute to that. So I, I don't think I'd make a, a, a confident prediction one way or the other. Um, I would say, I don't think it's bad. That is to say, I don't think, since the court is political, mm -hmm. it does decide things that way. I don't think the right thing to do is to try and pull the wool over the eyes of everybody else in the country in order to enable them to do it. So, you know, they would adjust to that. That is his right. And I think the way they would adjust would be, you see this in Chief Justice Roberts now, since the court's going to have his name. And I, I think since he clerked for Judge Friendly before Rehnquist, he cares about the institutional perception of the court and clearly has changed his votes and the way he is working within the court in order to not have every case be a five, four straight ideological outcome because he knows. So, so those kinds of changes, like that's exactly what we want, right? That's the kind of accountability that still preserves their independence. And I think is the kind of balance we should be looking for. He's the only one doing it because it's gonna have his name, right? And, and you know, so yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that proposal, Cy? Well, I think, you know, term limits are a good idea across all three branches. Um, and I'm not opposed to them for the Supreme Court. I don't think, you know, it obviously doesn't address my problem or the problem that I perceive. And I think that many conservatives perceive with the court. And, you know, I don't, I don't I, it seems like Larry doesn't think it's a problem that we have a court that basically revises the constitution with the majority vote, or maybe even a super majority vote if that's changed. And that's, you know, it's, 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 he's, he's not, he doesn't need to believe what I believe and he can believe in any reform he wishes to. And that's why we have such a plethora of wonderful proposals out there. So I, I, I think there's something to this idea of 
term limits. I don't think the problem with the court now is that they're out of touch. I don't think Justice Breyer is out of touch. I don't think my boss is out of touch. Uh, he's very much in touch. 40% of the country is in touch with what, you know, e either of those justices. It's not like they believe in something that the rest of, you know, that no one in the country believes. Um, I, so I, I don't actually think that's the problem. The problem is that with enough votes, you can change the constitution as has, as has happened many, many times. And I, I just don't see that this particular reform really addresses that, but why, you know, given that Larry doesn't think it's a problem, it's not incumbent upon him no, to no. try to fix it. I do think it's a problem, but I, I think that these, these reforms correct it. So the question is, what's the form? That is to say, the assumption is that the question is, how do you want to recreate some degree of accountability while preserving some independence? So a legislative override does that, to be sure. So does, though, the ability to, for instance, push back by using court packing or jurisdiction stripping, particularly when you think about the way the dynamics works, because it shifts the equilibrium. Once the court knows that can happen, it pulls back or overturns itself. And so does the process of regular appointments because the court routinely corrects itself. So these are all devices to, to do it. And for me, in thinking about which one, it's more the pragmatic, we're you know, path dependent, where are we now? What's plausible to get done? Mm -hmm. Because we're not going back to scratch to start over and write a new constitution. So I'm, I'm comfortable with a process that I think is doable, that fits where we are politically now, but that provides what I think is a corrective, even if it's one that's a little slower than say a legislative override, but that is a lot better than a system of judicial supremacy in which basically the rest of the country is told, it's not your job, it's our job. And even in that system, they can go too far and there'll be pushback, but they have to go really, really far before it's perceived as too far. So it's to me, it's about, again, creating that sense of accountability with where the political system is. So you think that your proposal is more plausible than going back to the system that you suggested existed before with threats of, you know, court packing, you, you think that that's, that's gone? I, well, yeah, as I think we've just discovered in this moment, those, you know, I did put, uh, a lot of us put out the notion of increasing the size of the court, and you saw there's not taste for it, even on the left, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, as I say, what I like about the Crampton-Carrington thing is it can be done legislatively, and it is definitely, like, equally fair to both parties. There'd be no need to redo it again. Mm -hmm. Right. People are like, you pack the court now, then when the Republicans come in, they're going to add 10 more judges, which wouldn't happen. But, you know, this doesn't have that effect. It actually would settle into a system that both sides should be able to live with equally. Mm -hmm. So none of you are enthusiastic about the idea of adding justices. Well, I'd do it if I thought it would happen. Mm -hmm. you do it if you... I, but for a different reason. I think, I think in terms of the larger political dynamic, you know, the tit for tat game has to happen in order for them to realize that both sides need to stick with some norms. Mm -hmm. So both sides have been violating norms for a really long time. But, uh, you know, when the, the the last two, the Garland and Barrett thing in terms of these were really pretty big steps, I think, in terms of violating what had been understood norms for a long time. So I think you have to punish that in order for both sides to recognize that we've got to go find a system we can both live with. Um, I wouldn't pack it just so that the Democrats get to like finally get their majority again. If they win another couple of elections, it'll take care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a neutral way that one could argue for <clears throat> adding one justice um, or subtracting one justice, going to 10 or going to eight, which okay. is, uh, as I guess Larry indicated before, would, would solve the problem of the five to four, um, would, would effectively require a supermajority on the court to achieve anything. Mm -hmm. If we had an even number, and remember the framers started out with six. Mm -hmm. Why did they start out with six instead of five or seven? They must have. I, I don't think there's anything in the in the records of, of the convention or anything that, mm -hmm. of course, the Constitution doesn't give us a fixed number, but why the founding generation thought six was the right number, I don't actually know whether they ever said, but they must have had, had a reason. And, um, you know, I think that's actually worth looking at, as I say, from, from a politically neutral perspective, it wouldn't advantage um, one side or the other, but it would, in terms of the perceived accountability, at least there'd be a super majority uh, for the court to act. But would have the disadvantage of, as a practical matter, especially if you stick with judicial supremacy, just increasing the power of the lower courts. 
Because mm -hmm. any tie case, you're going to stick with the judgment below, and that means that the judgments below are going to, in the in the really high profile, politically controversial case, that's going to be the decider. Mm -hmm. No free lunch. Mm -hmm. so, so none of these these don't solve your problem, Cy. No, and I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I look. I think there's something to be said for you know age limits for all three branches, right? Chuck Schumer is the spring chicken in the in the in the Congress, and he's he's quite he's quite up there in age, and of course, uh, you know, a term limit has so, sort of functions as an age limit. It doesn't work very well, but it, it does something along those lines. But I mean, I, the fact that members of the House, you know, have elections every two years and therefore only have two-year terms, or the president has a four-year term, or the Senate six years, doesn't make it less of a contestable process and doesn't make the, what they're doing less important. I, I think if they're going to end up amending the Constitution over 18 years as opposed to over 30 years, I don't really see that getting the job done, and I don't really see how it affects their incentives. In fact, you know, you might think that they're going to sow their oats while they can. They're only there for 18 years. I can't play a long game of 30 years. I've got to do what I need to do in 18 years. So, I, I mean, I, I take Larry's point that it's hard to enact reforms and that his reform is modest and still useful, but I, I don't think it actually solves the problem that I'm talking about. I think his other things have the potential to, um, but, I, you know, I. I would just prefer some sort of newfangled check on what the court is able to do and what all courts are able to do vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution. Of course, I think there's maybe not another system in the world that has a Constitution as difficult to amend as ours. Mm -hmm. Although, it, you know, it's worth remembering that it was not written with the notion that it was going to be that difficult to amend, right? People yeah. forget this. Yeah. I mean, you know, there were only 13 states. They were weakening the rule from what had been unanimity. Every single amendment that had been defeated in the Confederation period would pass by the rule they adopted. So it, it got hard because both there were an increase in the number of states and because of the slavery issue and the way it played out in the mid 19th century and made people sort of think they let's treat the constitutional text like holy writ as a way to defer this 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 problem and so on. So, but it is that hard to amend. It is act, a fact today anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's hard to amend, and that is you're right. This is not the way they planned it. But do you, do you have any ideas and about? Well, you sort of suggested something just there, Larry, but why so many Americans, why Americans treat the Constitution almost like a holy text yeah, and don't want to touch it? It's how don't. we teach it, right? I mean, Pardon me? it's how we teach it. It, it is the, po the political culture in this country. So, you know, I mean, we celebrate its age. We celebrate the wisdom of the founding fathers. And by the way, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think they did a pretty remarkable job um particularly given you know what and all of that but you know most of them also thought it should be easily amendable i always love that jefferson quote about you know having a man wear the same cody wore as a boy so you know but we have for a very long time and in very many ways created that in the political culture and it would be it's really hard to undo now i think and does that has that contributed to judicial supremacy that isn't that a in order to the court does what we what the people allowed them to do i mean to go along with you know yeah but i don't time. see those things as connected because exactly. imagine the world before judicial supremacy which again only meant that all three branches understood themselves as having co-equal authority to interpret mm -hmm. they could still have all had the same kind of reverence toward the text as they interpreted it mm -hmm. but you wouldn't say that branch's interpretation gets to trump everybody else's mm -hmm. So you don't think the modern worship of the founding fathers has made it even more difficult to, to move out of this? Only insofar as it's been coupled with a story, which is not true, that the founding fathers meant for there to be judicial supremacy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which they didn't. Which they didn't. So from your perspective as clerks, you both clerked on the Supreme Court. Uh, does that... Did that inform, has that informed your current day understanding of what needs to be done or whether anything needs to be done about this, the Supreme Court today? What did you learn there that helps you think about this? Larry, you've, you, were you a popular constitutionalist when you <laughs> were a clerk? So or? the short answer is it took me a long time to think my way through that, but sort of yes, which was 
as anyone who clerked with you could tell you, I spent the whole year like in a rage because I was so disappointed to get up there and see that there were these nine pe people who like the law mattered to them. Not all the stories that I had been told that might justify the kind of power we gave them just were not true. Mm -hmm. wasn't how they operated, you know, and so it was such a huge disappointment and also that sense like why, I mean, I'm with Cy on this, why would you give this kind of power to these nine people? To me, as I say, the fact that they've been appointed a long time ago makes it worse, uh, it just made less and less sense, you know. When I graduate, when I took my first teaching job, I wrote this up in an article and was strongly advised not to publish it, um, particularly back then, because like that was not the way, and I, I did, I cut it down to a, just the part about the bureaucratization of the court, the way in which there was really a bureaucracy with the clerks and the process and the justices were not all that hands-on and, and so on, but left out the other stuff. It took me years to really think my way through, but yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How's your view about this change, Sai, from the time that you were a clerk or is it pretty much similar? Your, your view of rewriting the constitution the role the court has played? Well, you know, and that I had this view before I went to had the pleasure of clerking for Justice Thomas, and I had it afterwards, and I had it even though I had, you know, I had the you know, I had great esteem for all the justices. They were super smart people. They were very nice people. Um, I think they were sincere people. I don't I don't know if even you know the I don't know if any justice sort of conceived themselves as engaging in an ongoing constitutional convention of the sort that I described earlier. Mm -hmm. But I didn't come away thinking, oh, you know, this is this is a good system. I, I think if you were to ask Americans, just to go back to Larry's point, do we want to have five justices revise the Constitution on an ongoing basis? I don't know anyone who would want that system, but I think that's in fact what we have given the heterogeneity of views about the Constitution and the difficulty of amending the constitution and the fact that these people have done it successfully for, for decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, again, I just want to underscore that is true to the extent and because we attach finality to the court's interpretations. As I say, the, the problem where I think we do disagree, do agree, which is then what is a system of reform that would peel back the finality? And, and as I say, there are many different ways to do that because there's many different forms of accountability. And so you, you, the, you don't think, and Linda, you, and you can answer this as well, that there's any good thing about finality, about having a body of people who say this is the answer? I mean, hasn't that been a cohesive thing in American culture and a very, very diverse culture? You know, we talk about other countries I mean, we've been trying to do something here that other people haven't tried to do. And that's in the same way, to the same extent, knit together different races, lots of, you know, freedom of all the kinds of things that we think of the American story here. And the one thing, one of the things we have is that when the court says something, people say, okay, um, yes. that's that. No matter as much, no, you may not like it. Uh, and you say, we'll come back next time, or we'll keep working, or we'll do other things. There's no virtue to the finality of it, or is it just that you think another body should be that final? Let, let, let me say a, a couple of things. One, I mean, Sai has said several, quite, quite a few times uh, in, in, a, in a voice of dismay, uh, you know, the court has changed the constitution. And, you know, I just want to put in a word for saying, you know, and thank heavens they have in many respects, in many respects, okay? Uh, and at, as to finality, of course, what we've seen uh, really in the entire time any of us have been living on this earth is actually there's, there's nothing final. I mean, was it, was it Robert Jackson who said, you know, we're not uh, uh, final because we're correct, but we're correct because we're final, but anything through the, you might say, the process of popular constitutionalism is open to revisiting. And just as one example, um, and it's an example of something else too that I'll, uh, I'll get to. So um, Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas the other day signed a bill that, um, signed into law, a bill that, that basically bans abortion in the state of Arkansas. And uh, he was asked about this, you know, how can you sign this? You've taken an oath when you, you know, were sworn in as governor to uphold the constitution. And this is obviously unconstitutional. 
And he said, yeah, it is obviously unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional on purpose to give the Supreme Court the chance to revisit its abortion precedents. Okay? So, so we have the court you know, sitting out there as a foil, uh, a, a, as a cover for politicians to do that kind of thing. Uh, but what it tells us is that uh, the American public indeed does not accept the finality of the court when, when it impinges on um, other preferences that they have. And we've seen over time, uh, whether it's you know, the law of habeas corpus, the law of free exercise, which is you know, totally in the um, midst of, of fundamental change right this minute because of the cases that they're the energy that the religious right is um, aiming at the at the Supreme Court, um, everything is always up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I? I mean, the way I would, it is a political dynamic, no matter what. The only finality is actually when the the country as a whole comes to embrace a value, and the court's intervention in that, like that of any of the other branches, is part of that political dynamic. So think about comparing, for instance, Brown to Roe to Furman to, say, Lawrence. You know, in each of those cases, the court intervenes in a way, but there's there's no finality in the court's decision. It's just the kind of pushback that you get. The, I, the ideology of judicial supremacy is a way of saying to the community, you should defer to what the justices say because it's their job, not yours. And it has a pretty powerful effect. Um, not a complete effect, because even there, there could be, so the pushback on Brown was because supremacy was not yet settled. But of course, to my mind, the, the reactions to it, as horrible as the early ones were, nevertheless led to an actual settlement that shows up in the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65. Mm -hmm. And then what came after that? So that was, that's a really good example from my perspective of what I think of as popular constitutionalism. Some of these others, I think, are really more problematic and the question you have are all the distortions in that political system that come, Linda just gave one really good example. I mean, to me, in any system where somebody says you should vote for A rather than B for president because they're gonna pick Supreme Court justices, tells you that something is deeply wrong with your democracy, right? That is not, that is not, should not be the basis for choosing the chief executive and so on. So there are a lot of distortions that this finality for the court, which isn't real finality, but just a distortion of the politics, I think, produces. Sai? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I agree with Linda at some level that nothing is truly final. Things get contested over time. But I, I also think that the, the ability to push back on the court, however we wish to frame that and whatever proposals we wish to take up, isn't going to end finality because on most issues, the country doesn't care what the court says, and they're happy to have the court decide it. Right. And they may grumble about it in the short term, but then they move on. Right. You gr you grumble about a ref's play on the field and then you you move on. It's it's rare as the case where people are talking about, you know, a, a call that a ref made a year ago. And I think there are more situations where people get upset with what the court does. But on most questions, the, the public is happy to, to have someone decide it finally and the political branches are as well. And it will be final. So even even with proposals that try to take away some aspect of the court's finality, there's still gonna be a lot of finality as you described it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've talked, the word practicality has come up or notions of practicality have come up as we've had this discussion. Uh, Larry, you have your proposals, Sai, you've mentioned proposals as well. Of the things that you could think could happen, what would be the most important thing to be done, reform that could be enacted for the court that's, that you think is doable? Age, you know, term limits, age limits, you know, what, what can be done? Um, Nothing that requires amending of the constitution is gonna be done. <laughs> so you have to start, I think you have to start there, mm -hmm. um, which is why, as I said, it's like the part of the Crampton Carrington proposal and it is their proposal, not mine from 2005, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is that it can be done, I believe statutorily. Do you think that that's true, Sai? That it, it wouldn't require? I mean, the, the problem with the proposal is that there are people called Supreme Court justices who don't get to sit on the case and they're not they're not retired. Right. And so it seems to divest them of the principal function of their office. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just going to add new people until you, you know, reach some elite equilibrium, that's a different proposal than I think the one that Larry described. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the sitting Supreme Court justices like, you know, 
Thomas or or Breyer are going to say I'm still you know I still have the same office I had before I'm still I'm a Supreme Court justice it seems like a very different office than the one they occupy now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, th theoretically, the easiest thing to do uh, would be to bring back the filibuster for Supreme Court confirmations. But of course, that would require unilateral disarmament um, of the current by the by the current uh, Senate majority, which could do it by simple majority, change the rules as uh, as Senator McConnell did in in uh, 2017. Uh, so, although theoretically that's an easy thing to do, politically that's not going to happen. I mean, for what it's worth, the Constitution says that there shall be a Supreme Court. And the Constitution says that people who are appointed as Article III judges have to have life tenure and salary protection. So, and you know, the court held in Stewart v. Laird, right, the companion case to Marbury, that actually Congress could change the courts around and transfer judges from one court to another. So I don't actually see any problem. No one's saying they can't sit on cases. They can sit on cases. Um, they would just sit on cases in the other federal courts, which are Article III courts and so on. So I don't actually see a problem with it, but it would certainly be an issue that would come up and you would have the problem of the sitting justices, you know, saying, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> like you're the most senior one who's what Thomas now would be, wait a minute, you're telling me in two years, I have to stop sitting on Supreme Court cases, unconstitutional, you know, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and then we would be stuck with them because we think they're final. Yeah, yeah. How old is Thomas? So I, you, know, uh, you know, he's eternally young in my heart. But I actually eternally think young in your prior, heart. It's not the oldest. It's just the prior might be older than than. Yeah, than, yeah. Than, yeah I think my age is old. seniority. He's the seniority. He's the most, senior, Bri on the yeah, he's the most senior on the court. Yeah, I think he. I think he's seventy. Mm -hmm. So what? So what is the? You mentioned eighteen years side. No, I think I that's the Crampton Carrington proposal that. Okay. Larry as a practical matter. Eight, as a practical matter, eighteen years would it, if Linda, do you think that there should be term limits and would 18 years be enough? Well, the choice of 18 years is because that would regularize two appointments for each four-year presidential term. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. that's higher math than I can do, but I'll take it for granted that that's, that's how it works. And mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. Mm -hmm. Do I think it would solve these issues? Um, no, mm -hmm. but I, it's an interesting thought experiment. And as I said, the whole world has voted with their, its feet uh, in, in that direction mm -hmm. when it comes to governing themselves. You know, the world has voted with its feet on, the, on our Constitution overall, <laughs> on every aspect of it. They like the Declaration, not the Constitution so much. Um, you know, it's a lot to think about. I mean, one other proposal that people have talked about is limiting the court's jurisdiction, appellate jurisdiction. Would that is that attractive to you, Linda? You know, I, I, I could see that happening. Um, and Larry will tell me whether or not that's uh, consistent with Article 3, but I think it is. I mean, for instance, suppose 11 years ago when uh, Congress passed and President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, uh, knowing that it was going to be subject to um, cockamamie constitutional attacks, uh, could Congress have added a, a clause that said, uh, and, and this statute shall not be subject to judicial review? Mm -hmm. Larry, would that have been theoretically? Well, yeah, there's a, well, there's a debate on that issue, although it's one of those post 1960s debates. My own view is as long as consistent with due process, which is there has to be the, the ability to raise the issue somewhere. It doesn't have to be in the Supreme Court. It may not even have to be in federal courts. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Congress created no federal courts other than the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which would have to be in the Supreme Court. You could put it anywhere you want. I don't, to me, it doesn't solve the problem though, um, because the appointment process for lower courts is sort of the same. It just shifts it. Um, and you have the same problem of finality and independence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we've gotten a lot of questions that have been sent to me here. And thank you for this discussion. And now we're going to figure out what the audience is interested in and what they think about all of this. Uh, I have one question. Could, isn't the essence of the problem that Congress in many areas refuses to legislate? For instance, why doesn't Congress pass a law saying what should happen to minors caught across crossing the border illegally? Or what should happen to dreamers? 
the court is society's last resort. So this person is saying Congress is the problem. The Congress doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing. And so somebody has to act. You know, to me, I'll just jump in, I guess, um, which is that's a we need to understand how separation of powers works, right? The idea is it's meant to be fluid and flexible. So Congress is supposed to act, but the, if it doesn't, then other branches are going to fill in. That's part of the dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer to, isn't to say, let's somehow make Congress do something. Congress isn't acting. You're right. That creates this problem. All of it comes down, not to Congress, it comes down to voters. It comes down to people who are putting these people in office and putting them back in office and not punishing them when they don't act and, and are willing to accept what the court does. I mean, at the end of the day, there is absolutely accountability. The problem is these doctrines distort how it works. But, you know, the, that's just the dynamics of separation of powers. President's going to step in when he or she can, unless Congress steps in or the court steps in, and so on. And that's that's that is the design of the system. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Well, Congress sometimes uh, sometimes does nothing, or sometimes affirmatively wants to push something off to the courts mm -hmm. um, by you by legislating with just very open-ended phrases, knowing that, or sometimes explicitly saying. Uh, that the court will fill in the blanks. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's why we have the, the, a new interest in the non-delegation doctrine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yes. Does the state of the federal judiciary at present herald a, a possible return to the dominance of the state courts as the first line for handling challenging issues? Well, Larry Clerk for Justice Brennan, and that was one of his projects, right? Yeah. What do you think, Larry? <laughs> I want to let. I want to. I'm feeling a little. Okay. Uh, so, I. What do you think? What is that? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I. I you know, the, the federal courts are open and operating. Whether you like what they're doing is another question. But I don't know why there's anything that's going on in the lower federal courts that would cause people to go to the state courts. Of course, if you find that the federal courts are hostile to your claims, you'll then go to the state courts and try to raise state constitutional claims. And maybe that's what Linda and Larry are, are, are sort of referencing that maybe state courts are gonna be more dynamic interpreting their state constitutions than a more conservative Supreme Court might be. So you think this is, is this a, a left versus right question? A lot of this is concerned about the courts, that there's concern about the courts because the courts are not doing what certain groups of people want them to do. It's a well, problem I, because, you know, they're not. Well, certainly, you know, and that certain, a lot of the disquiet in the country is not because Republicans got more nominees, but because of the people that were appointed. If they were progressives and they happened to be appointed by Republicans, then progressives wouldn't be upset with what happened or they wouldn't be as upset. But it would be a purely procedural objection, but it's procedural. It's it's phased procedurally, but the concern is entirely substantive. They are afraid of what these new justices will do. So, of course, the disquiet is strongest amongst the, you know, the progressive elements in our country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would let me say this. I do think we can and should step back, so we can concede the following: political actors are going to act politically, <laughs> no question, and any action has consequences that one side or the other is going to like or not. That's a step that can't disqualify the rest of us from being able to take a position without being told you're only taking that position because of your political views, right? Because I have I have to take a position. Uh, to me, you know, it is possible to talk about what should the rules of baseball be without, even if I'm a Cubs fan, I actually have problems with the Cubs, but even if I'm a Cubs fan, I'm not twisting those rules so that the Cubs win every game. I can think about the rules, even though in fact, those rules may help the Cubs win right now, you know, and so, I mean, when Justice Brennan made that argument, yes, he was saying if the federal courts have shut down for the expansion of rights, go try the state courts. And he was urging political actors to act politically, no question about that. Um, as I say, it's a separate question though from the merits of an idea. Uh, and I do think we can separate them. Mm -hmm. Question for Mr. Prakash, are you in favor of constitutional departmentalism? If so, how would that work in practice? Well, I, I, I agree with Larry that the Supreme Court and the judiciary as a whole isn't the final arbiter of what the Constitution means. Um, 
that the political branches have long pushed back against the Supreme Court's interpretations from, from Jefferson on, right? Jefferson disagreed with Federalist interpretations of the Constitution with respect to the Sedition Act and pardoned a bunch of people and non-prosecuted a bunch of others. And then of course, Jackson denies Marshall's opinion in uh, the Bank of the United States case, McCulloch versus Maryland. Lincoln says, we will oppose Dred Scott. We don't propose freeing Dred Scott, but we won't. We're gonna push and push to get the court to overturn its case. So there's this long been this tradition of fighting against the court's uh, decisions, not necessarily its judgments, but the precedential weight of those decisions. And there's nothing in the constitution that says that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of the constitution. That is entirely a political judgment that people have made as a matter of convenience or as a matter of practice. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the Caroline products problem created following the Rucho and Citizens United decisions? How do you address the problem of political entrenchment in the absence of court reform? Well, that's kind of the, uh, the underlying premise of, of all the conversations that are going on about court, so court reform. Um, so, you know, that goes to the heart of the matter, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, there, again, we're not helpless. So it's not as though there have not been major political reforms all across American history, even though there's always entrenchment by definition. So the, again, the we, we have major problems in our political system now. We have a truly broken party system in which we don't really even have parties anymore. All of our political mechanisms are, are hugely dysfunctional and so on, but the courts aren't gonna fix or solve any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and the courts are of no help on political entrenchment either, as we see. So, you know, so the, the, what ails democracy requires a kind of democratic solution. You, there are no easy fixes there, which is this notion that we'll like have five of these nine justices and they will save us from ourselves. It just doesn't work that way, never has, mm -hmm. never will. I'm always mostly struck, again, I don't see this as left right, but I am struck at the embrace of the left of the idea that the court is gonna be their savior because apart from like the 10 years of the Warren court and an occasional other decision, the court has systematically been an anti-progressive institution, uh, you know, across, you know, and so it's, it's just a peculiar sort of fetish from that brief period. Mm -hmm. Is not one role for the Supreme Court to be quote, out of touch unquote, with the prevailing political winds and thus be a damper on the wider swings in the body politic? I mean, to, it, I mean, I guess this is to Larry's <laughs> point about uh, one of the, the problems he sees with the, with the court is that these are old people out of touch with the rest of society. And this person is saying, well, isn't it good that they're out of touch uh, with the prevailing political winds? So, th so that's an argument for the, the counter-majoritarian uh, essence of, of the court, I guess. And, um, uh, you yeah, know, but why would you assume that, you, let's say you're choosing one view over another? <laughs> I don't know, but dampen like with some notion that they have something good and right as opposed to just a different set of views. Right. I mean, so the question is, why would you want to lock yourselves into the views of a bunch of political appointees from the 1950s in the 1980s when that's, you know, no longer where you are and so, you know, and so on. So, yes, they are. If they are functioning as a dampening device, I'm not quite sure why one would think that's a good thing uh, as opposed to an arbitrary thing, which is which, which sometimes you're going to like and sometimes you're not. And again, I'm trying to get away from that as a way to think about it. If you believe in democracy, those swings are what we call republicanism. Yeah, but I mean, there's Repub I suppose there are limits to republicanism that people are concerned about what they would have called the mob, uh, cons you know, with people who, with the passions of a particular moment, prejudices, making decisions about, uh, you know, people yeah. who are vulnerable. I mean, and and the whole system is built there, and includes the court. Remember, we're not talking about getting rid of judicial review. So there are lots of ways in which we, we do check that and call it into question, right? So as I said, no one's saying court, you can't interpret individual rights cases. 
those interpretations are become part of the debate, as do the pushback in the legislature. Right, the whole system is designed to dampen those things, yeah. but it, I don't see where it requires judicial supremacy over the most. Imp we say basically, republicanism means self-government, except for the really important law <laughs> that we're going to give to a little mini monarchy over here on the side. Right, that just doesn't make sense to me. You know, maybe it's worth noting that, uh, I and mean, we've talked about the life tenure problem really exclusively as justice is getting old and out of touch. Um, that's not my, that, that's not where my interest in it comes from. My interest in it comes from uh, the impact that the existence of life tenure has on the electoral, on the political process. But, uh, you know, we have seen over time that uh, justices who stayed a long time has actually shifted their views. Um, mostly toward the left, to the great dismay on, on the right. Um, you know, we've seen that in, in modern times. We haven't, we're not likely to see it maybe again because of the very, very careful vetting that's going on with these people. But, um, but to get old <clears throat> on the bench is not necessarily never to have a new idea. I just want to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Annette? Mm -hmm. Would this be unfair? I, you know, you're as versed in this as any of us. I am totally curious. <laughs> no. You know, I want to your view on this. Uh, I think the court should be larger. I think the kind of problem, the kind of, the kind of solution that you have, that you, that you support, isn't, it isn't clear to me how that solves the problem you see. The problem I see is with people not being involved in the political process, citizens not being involved in the, enough in the political process and making Congress do the things that Congress is supposed to do. I, I see Congress as more of a problem than the court. Uh, and so I haven't, to be honest, fixated on this that much other than the recent calls for you know just disputes about whether or not they're going to pack the court or so forth i think congress is more is broken uh to me more than the court so i'm willing to go with the court as it is now if we could get some changes in the other branches of government um figuring out about the executive but mainly congress at this point um so that's a deflection but I, there, here's a qu question that does go to something that I think I wonder about myself. Do you think the court, regardless of the leanings of the current justices, is too vulnerable to the idiosyncras idiosyncrasies of particular personalities and should be enlarged to get a more stable balance in this decision? Right? You know, we started out with six justices when they're what, 4 million, 5 million people, and now they're 350 million people and they're nine. Um, Leaving aside the questions that we've been talking about today, the issues should what well, does it make sense for it to be larger? The court. Well, and so this person is yeah. suggesting that you might the more if you had more people, you could there would you would sort of even out. He says idiosyncrasies, whatever that might be, of uh, personalities, and you would get a, a better diversity of views. I don't really see that unless there's some fundamental change in the appointment and confirmation process. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the Ninth Circuit has, I think, 27 or so authorized judgeships. Um, and they have a lot of quirky people on that, on, on, on that circuit. So um, uh, I, 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 I don't see it having, expanding the court would have that kind of impact. Mm -hmm. no, no. Again, as I said, this is not about, not necessarily about solving any problems that we've identified, but just as a practical matter, given the size, as the country has gotten larger, um, more circuits, more people, and it's the same, and the, should the court remain the same size? I said Congress should be bigger too, but should the court um, be any larger than it is? Um, pardon me? I was gonna say, I'd say, I don't think idiosyncratic personalities have actually been much of a problem on the court. When they are there, they tend to be kind of isolated as opposed to all that influential. And just speaking here from experience on a lot of boards, 
nine to 12, I mean, it's not like nine is a magic number, but, but you cease to be functional if you're going to have them sitting on bonk and working together as a group. Mm -hmm. um, once you get it's kind of larger than 12 is, is sort of my experience and smaller than eight or so is also really problematic. Mm -hmm. Let's see. When I was at HLS, this is from HLS person, when I was in the HLS in the late 70s, Felix Frankfurt was warning that an activist court would lead to the court becoming political. Um, a, a political issue was generally mocked. Do you think in retrospect, his warnings should be reconsidered? Well, I mean, he was, that was true in the seventies, right? There was impeachable warrant signs all over the place. So I, I mean, I think even before the seventies, right? So mm -hmm. I think, you know, Larry would say the court has long been a, a political institution. I'm not so sure, um, but it certainly is now. And I think it certainly was in the sixties and seventies for, for the, you know, the constitutional changes that the court wrought. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the very phrase activist court, uh, you know, is in the eye of the beholder, so. <clears throat> and if you think historically, every time the court pushes, even in the eras before supremacy, if they pushed, they became a political issue. I mean, they were a political issue in the Dred Scott era. They were a political issue in the progressive era. They were a political issue in the New Deal era and so on, because they pushed themselves into politics. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, he's right, and of course, what we've done by empowering them the way we have is just made that systematically more true. Mm -hmm. Are any of you concerned about the emergence of the shadow docket? And if so, what would you suggest to address that concern? Well, so I guess people know the shadow docket is, is uh, the court deciding case, deciding matters that it does not grant cert to, but just does without plenary review, mm -hmm. without argument. Uh, and the reason it's emerged as an issue is that uh, during the Trump administration, uh, the court did a whole lot of business on uh, granting stays, um, enabling death penalties to be carried out and so on without uh, you know, the sunlight that comes from granting cert, having merits briefs filed, arguments and a full opinion that people sign their names to. So, um, I think it has become a problem. Uh, it's become, a, it's a kind of a lazy man's way of doing the court's business. And I think um, it may be within, uh, you know, the power of Congress to uh, somehow make them knock it off. Um, but I, I, I can't see Congress sort of getting its act together to intervene at that level, but it's certainly worth um, people paying attention to and, uh, and critiquing, I think. Mm -hmm. Linda gave a number of examples of conservative, we have enough time for another, just a couple of questions. Linda gave a number of examples of conservative presidents who appointed justices that ended up more liberal than expected. Are there any examples the other way? I think the only, I'm asked this all the time and I think the kind of maybe the, an answer is um, John F. Kennedy's appointment of Byron White, who remain liberal to the end of his days on the question of the authority of the federal government in the civil rights arena. That was core to him. But, you know, he was a dissenter from uh, Miranda. He was a dissenter from Roe. Um, he, he was, you know, became kind of, kind of curmudgeonly con ever more conservative on social issues uh, yeah. as, his, as his tenure got got longer. So he's the kind of one living, one example, at least in my time that I can think of. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably lots of them across American. I mean, Jefferson's appointment of Joseph Story, obviously. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's actually lots of them um, mm -hmm. across American history. We just haven't focused as much on the earlier justices as we mm -hmm. do on the current ones. Tawny, also arguably by, you know, by Jackson, and he ends up in a weird way. And all, certainly he's not always online with what one would have expected from a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Final question. If the Supreme Court were not to be the final arbiter of the Constitution, how would a case like Bush v. Gore be resolved with any finality? That would have been resolved in Congress under the Electoral Count Act. That was the whole debate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why was, the, why was the Supreme Court intervening when, when there was a federal statute that would have resolved 
the uh, a, a disputed election. So, uh, you know, that's the answer to that. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty well, easily too, yeah. right? You can play that out really straightforwardly. If the court hadn't intervened. So imagine in the world's worst scenario that three slates went. You're the one that confirmed by the Secretary of State. Suppose the four legislature actually created a new one. And suppose the count had taken place in favored Gore and had they all gone to Congress, what would you have had? So you would have had a House that would have supported the Republican because it was a Republican House. You would have had a Senate that arguably would have supported Gore, but it would have been 51 to 50 turning on Lieberman's vote. Mm -hmm. and and public opinion was already hugely shifting in favor of Bush. 99% of Republicans still supported Bush. I think Democratic support was down to about 63%. So two or three rounds and some of those blue dog Democrats would have for the interests of the country backed off and it would have been resolved pretty straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, you know, again, that's politics isn't always completely irrational. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all very much for this. This is a very bracing conversation. This is something that's going to continue, uh, whether we think there should be reform, whether it actually comes about, we'll still continue to talk about it because people are interested in it. I think Sai's point about uh, people's regard for the court is still is important, uh, that people, despite problems, look to it as the one branch of government, a branch of government that they see as working. And it makes sense for scholars and people who study it uh, to worry about it and to think about it maybe more than ordinary people do. Um, this has been great and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for all the people who came to, came in to turn into watches and thanks for the very good questions. Good evening. <laughs>